But if it's deterministic, maybe there is only one state that this thing can go in, and therefore is entropy again just really a human construct about uh, the fact that we can't, can't know, and this is a language which we've produced in order to navigate this unknowability. Order and disorder, are they human concepts? And should we question the universal authority of the second law of thermodynamics? Uh, there's a question for a Sunday morning, gosh. Um, well, I, I guess uh, perhaps I should start by saying I think, you know, mathematics is, in a sense, the search for order in the chaos around us. I mean, I think that's how mathematics evolved as a subject, to try and kind of make sense of whether there are uh, rules to the, to the way the kind of world works. Um, and of course, you know, we had this incredible breakthrough with Newton and his contemporaries where we seem to um, produce the laws of motion, which perhaps since everything uh, atom is a, uh, something under these laws of motion, led to this kind of belief post uh, Newton that we lived in a universe that could be totally predicted. Uh, Laplace had that famous uh, statement, Laplace's demon about, you know, if we knew the setup of, of everything at this point, in time, the atoms, uh, where they are, how they're moving. You just run the uh, laws uh, that have been discovered to predict the future and, and you know everything. So from that point, it seemed like, uh, well, the universe um, is predictable and ordered. Um, but of course, that kind of changed uh, with the discovery uh, end of the 19th century, beginning of 20th century, uh, with the idea of chaos theory, that even if, if a system is deterministic, that doesn't really help because you can never have complete knowledge of all of the particles um, and their way they move. So you can only have partial knowledge and that uh, leads in a chaotic system to being very unclear what's going to happen next. So I, I brought a little, my favorite example of a chaotic system. This is a, my favorite desktop toy. Um, it's such a simple uh, piece of kit. It's just too metal pieces joined together at a joint here. I mean, pendulums we use to keep track of time, they're so predictable. But this double pendulum um, is very unpredictable to uh, uh, decide what it's going to do next. Because um, it just, uh, I mean, it's just the fact that some of you are, oh, look at that. Some of you are laughing. <laughs> the laughter is, an, in a sense, a response to this, uh, this uh, unpredictability of the thing. But chaos theory is all about the fact that if I try and repeat exactly that motion, um, uh, then it's, uh, remember what it did last time? Well, it certainly didn't do that. Oops, and it didn't do that. Uh, that was a bit of my energy putting in there. But the idea that, it, um, so this idea, first of all, I mean, there, there are quite a few things going on in this talk, but the first one is order and chaos. And we have to recognize that even with an ordered system, a deterministic system, um, there is the possibility of this inability for us to know. And therefore, we have to come up with other ways to deal with this unknowability. So although the, the system is deterministic, you could say the probability theory was the development um, of a tool, a human tool, in order to try and navigate unknowability. So um, I was giving talks about games yesterday, and uncertainty is a very important component of, of games. And the fact that we can't predict what two dice are going to do when we're playing Monopoly is part of the fun. But we've developed this tool to give us some sense of being able to tell uh, what might happen in a chaotic system. So dice are, by their nature, chaotic. A very small change in the um, release position will produce a very different answer. So I think, first of all, there are human constructs like probability. And the other one will be entropy. And I think um, probably a physicist is better to, to meet the uh, uh, challenge of entropy. But if you think entropy is um, a measure of the different possibilities that a state could be in, um, uh, a sandcastle has low entropy because it's kind of bound. But sand can be many different uh, things. So the entropy goes up because it wants to be destroyed. But if it's deterministic, I mean, we haven't even introduced quantum physics into this yet. Maybe we'll go there. 
But if it's deterministic, maybe there is only one state that this thing can go in, and therefore is entropy again just really a human construct about uh, the fact that we can't, can't know, and this is a language which we produced in order to navigate this unknowability, that if we could reduce everything to mathematics, we'd be absolutely fine. But these physicists, <laughs> biologists, have to create some sort of uh, meta language because they, they can't deal with the kind of complexities that we have at the base of mathematics. <laughs> it's a controversial segment. Of so a human concept, in other words. Yes, a human concept. Yes. OK, next, Marika. I'm not sure I can follow that, actually. I don't have any toys or anything. <laughs> so I'm going to give a physicist perspective. And um, so for me, at a basic level, you can just define order and disorder in a very precise way, which is objective. It doesn't depend on which observer is looking at it. So if we think about you know, um, a, a line of magnets, um, we can actually you know, define how ordered they are. If they're all aligned in the same direction, we'd say they're ordered. If they're randomly up and down, we'd say that they're disordered. So from that perspective, for me, that the answer to the basic question is this, is, this is something which is an objective concept. But you know, the universe, the world, is not just a line of magnets. It gets more and more complicated. And so as, we sort of, you know, as we're thinking about you know, the, the behavior of the Earth, the behavior of the solar system, as Marcus is saying, you know, it's evolving in time. It's really, really complicated. Um, we can, you know, the mathematical model for, for how you define how ordered or disordered it is becomes increasingly difficult to calculate. Even if in principle you can do so, you have to make, start making some assumptions. And then as you scale up to the universe as whole, well, we're in a very atypical part of the universe. We're in a place where there is life. And actually the universe as a whole is very cold, it's very dark, it's very empty. And so actually comparing the amount of order and disorder there is in the universe as a whole compared to what we see locally around us these are two very, very different questions, and you get very different answers. And I think it would be good to come back to that. OK. Thank you, Marika. And uh, Nick? Uh, so I, I, most of my work is actually on the origin of life. Uh, and so you could say it is pulling order out of disorder. Uh, and over the last 10 years or so, I've come to think absolutely the opposite way around. So probably most of you in this room would have heard of the primordial soup. And immediately you'll think chaos, disorder is you know, messiness. And then you wonder how on earth do these molecules come together and become ordered? Um, so, and the other thing that you've probably heard of is the RNA world, the idea that genes are the beginning of biology is the beginning of information. And then you have this big problem about where does genetic information, where does this order come from? It's something that kind of congeals out of a soup or something. Well, no, I think the whole lot is completely wrong. Um, and there's a lot of order in the world. Now, the, part of the problem with the question is, is, is confounding uh, a, a closed system with an open system. I mean, probably very deliberately so. But, you know, the Earth is an open system. We're bombarded by light, which is fairly low entropy from the sun. And we're projecting um, higher entropy energy off the Earth all the time. And we're roughly, uh, we're, we're roughly in equilibrium, which is why the world doesn't heat up all the time. Um, so, so, so life is, a, is, is also an open system. Stuff comes in, stuff goes out. So in, there's no sense in which life is defeating the second law of thermodynamics. But there's another aspect here, which is the difference between, I would say, informational entropy, Shannon entropy, which has become quite dominant in physics, and what I would call chemical entropy, the old-fashioned um, thermodynamics of the 19th century. Um, and here we're dealing, I mean, this can be taken into consideration in, in informational entropy, but chemistry is about interactions between molecules. And so if you've got oil spreading on water, it's going to spread across the surface of the water because they're emissible. And so there's some order in that, but entropy has increased because that ordering is a lower energy state and the energy difference is released into the universe as heat. And so entropy has increased as a result of that ordering. And cells are pretty much the same way. And the Earth is ordered. The Earth is a kind of a, a giant battery. Because of gravity, all the iron goes straight down to the middle, to the core and in the, in the mantle. There's a lot of electrons down there. And in, in the atmosphere and in the oceans, it's pretty oxidized. And so we, we've effectively, it's, it's a giant battery. And that's where the power is coming from. And the places where the power is tapped is in places like hydrothermal vents, where we've got a continuous flow, a continuous reactivity. I'll just finish with this. Carbon dioxide and hydrogen are the starting points for life as we know it, and I would say this is where the origin of life is coming from as well. If you've got a test tube with carbon dioxide and hydrogen, you warm it to 50 degrees centigrade, shake it up, 
you know that nothing's going to happen. But in terms of the thermodynamics, the entropy of it, if you allowed that reaction to go ahead, if, if you catalyze it in some way, you would get cells and energy is released. So the formation of cells from these two gases is actually entropically favored because uh, overall the heat of the universe increases. So it's, we have these disequilibria in the environment and when, was, when we take this structure of the environment into consideration, the problem of the origin of life as an entropic problem just evaporates. Okay, thank you. Uh, the premise for this debate is in part rooted in the observation and the studies that there is a decreasing entropy on Earth